for the majority of people, 67% of people in these studies reported a calorie intake that was so low that not even an elderly, frail, bedridden woman could survive on it. When it comes to looking at studies on nutrition, we need to ask the right questions. What type of study is it? Who funded it? What kinds of variables were and weren't accounted for? In this mini episode, Dr. Hyman sits down with functional medicine clinician and educator Chris Kresser to help unpack what we need to consider when it comes to nutritional research. When you hear a headline like this, and I'm sure people are going to have heard this headline in the news that meat kills, it doesn't actually represent what the science says. So the consumer's confused, the media's confused, doctors get confused, and everybody's confused, but it's not so confusing. And you shed light on why it's not so confusing. So let's start with, at first, why we have problems with these studies and why we're so confused. And then we'll get into the real data on meat. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, as you pointed out, this study, along with many others like it, I mean, I could set my watch by how <laughs> often these studies come out claiming to show that meat increases the risk of death. We see it all the time. My email box blows up, social media blows yeah. up. But and, you said. Yeah, you said. And, and, you know, now at this point, I'm just linking to some articles I've written that has everything yeah. there. Read not this. even bothering to write anymore. It's the same response every single time. Yeah. And the response is, as you pointed out, when you do a large observational study, you're just showing two factors that are occurring together. You're not demonstrating a causal relationship that one factor is causing another factor. And, you know, there are many different examples of this. There, there's one blog um, name. I think the guy's name is Tyler. I can't remember his last name, but it's called Spurious Correlations. Yes. And yeah. he has basically collected a bunch of correlations that have nothing, clearly nothing yep. to do with one another. Like uh, the margarine consumption is like 99.7% correlated with the divorce rate in Maine. <laughs> Maybe it's connected because, you know, you know trans <laughs> yeah. fats may I would affect get a divorce probably brain. If, if my wife was feeding me margarine. She you, well, <laughs> yeah. Honestly, my mother used to give me Fleischmann's margarine when I was a kid because that was the 70s and Tang and Fleischmann's margarine were the right. future foods, right? <laughs> right. So it's it's really tempting to assume that variables are cor are causally related when they're not. And um, it's not a safe assumption, especially with the case of red meat, because um, of something called the healthy user bias or the unhealthy user bias, depending on how you look at it. So for decades, we've been told that red meat is not a healthy food. And yeah. so people who, on average in studies, if you're looking at the general population, people who tend to eat more red meat also tend to engage in more behaviors that are perceived as unhealthy. Right. So they might smoke more, they might drink more, they eat fewer fruits and vegetables, they don't, they're not as physically active, they're not as smoke well educated, more. they're lower income, which has nothing to do with their value as a person, but yeah. th these are correlated with lower, you know, higher risk of death, mm -hmm. um, more strongly than any nutritional factor. And, you know, they probably have an, uh, their microbiome is probably not as healthy because they eat lots of processed and refined food. Right. And researchers try to control for some of these uh, confounding factors, but there's no way that they can ever control for all of them. Another huge problem with nutritional epidemiology is the way that data are collected. <laughs> so yeah. most people are shocked when they learn how just how ridiculous this is. Yeah. But they use these assessments called food frequency questionnaires or yeah. other what are known as memory based assessments or memory based measures. So like so, what did you have for lunch yeah. last Thursday? What or? did you have for lunch last Thursday? How many servings of red meat did you eat four weeks ago, Mark? Oh, yeah, I mean, well. You and I think about food probably more, more than six, more, five <laughs> servings. And you and I think about food more than probably just about anybody, you know. So I can tell you what I ate yesterday, remember. but that's about it. <laughs> right, right. So, um, and, and, and to illustrate this, some researchers did an analysis of the nurses' health data, which which is what these new studies were based on. That meat the kills, The nurses' health right. study, that meat kills. And it's not like it was a 10% increase in risk. We'll we're going to get into that. that. Yeah, yeah, we're going to get into that. So they did an analysis of these memory-based assessments, and they found that the average, ca that uh, for the majority of people, 67% of people in these studies reported a calorie intake that was so low that not even an elderly, frail, bedridden woman could survive on it. That's right. So these are obese overweight people that are reporting a starvation level calorie intake. Yeah. So that alone just throws out the validity of all of the rest of the data because it would skew protein intake, 
fat intake, carbohydrate intake, and intake of every other food and nutrient. In other words, how they have bad memories or they're lying. Like, yeah, I, I mean, I, I remember when I was in training, we were taught, okay, whatever pe people tell you they eat, double it. And whenever right. people tell you they exercise, cut it in half. That's right. People <laughs> always report. They want to please on, you. They want to they do the right please thing. you, or they want to do like if uh, uh, they want to report what they think you want to hear. Essentially, that's and unless you're like weighing tendency. and measuring every single meal every like day and writing it down, yeah. then you know you're not going to be able to report what you ate. I mean, I don't know how much I ate no, yesterday or whatever. I'm like, I ate a little of this. I had some of that. I took a few bites of this. It's like, and if you even if you if you had two plates and the, the only difference, you know, one had a hundred or two hundred more calories, visually you couldn't even tell the difference. Yeah. So, like you said, unless you're weighing and actually specifically measuring them. And even then there are challenges on how to do that best to, yeah, you know, to, it's true in, in a ward. And Mayo Clinic wrote a big review showing yeah. how these types of assessments, these memory-based assessments or food frequency questionnaires really weren't valid. And yeah. they were so undermining the quality of all the science they're based on. So almost everything we hear about nutrition, almost whole, everything is based on these type of studies, which it, are fundamentally flawed. And there's a guy named John Ioannidis, yeah. who, you know, is, is a Stanford professor who loves to study studies. And he's like, 80% of these type of studies, we call them observational or population studies or comparison studies, they 80% get proven wrong, ultimately when they're subjected to randomized, randomized controlled, controlled trials, trials yeah. which is a true experiment, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's extremely critical <laughs> of nutritional epidemiology. He's basically said that it's worthless in, yeah. in the in the way that it's constructed now, and it could be improved by better measurement techniques and using some new technologies to yeah, maybe do that like more people take pictures of their food, yeah. and then it goes into a computer AI yeah. system and it exactly. measures them. like that yeah. would be cool. And then they're testing that, and yeah. that would help a lot. The other problem you also mention is. Uh, in any field outside of nutritional epidemiology, uh, a, an increase of risk of just 10% would be seen as completely uh, meaningless. insignificant, meaningless. meaningless, that you have this to see noise. at least a doubling of risk, like a 100% increase or a twofold increase or more in order to be able to know that you're not just dealing with chance, yeah. you know, uh, indistinguishable from chance. And, and the guy who published the study, uh, Walter Willard and, and others at Harvard, I mean, this comes out of Harvard. These are, yeah. these are stand up guys, but yeah. they've spent their whole life committed to epidemiology. Yeah. And, and they defend it tooth and nail. Yeah. You know, and I, I remember yeah. speaking to Ron Krauss, who's an experimental scientist who studies cholesterol and heart That's disease. Fat. And he's like, listen, you know, those are helpful for generating hypothesis, but they yeah. don't prove anything. And these yeah. guys who run around saying that they're proving something are misleading people. And, and he said, you know, you need to see a change of at least, you know, two. And Walter Willett said to me once, you know, well, we found this with smoking, that smoking... Right causes cancer but the increased risk was 20 or two yeah, three thousand yeah, percent two, two to three thousand percent not ten percent yeah so yeah. like if it's ten percent and not a thousand or two thousand percent Absolutely. at least a hundred percent yeah it's it's it's, and, it's just and, worth ignoring and like the thing with eggs that came out recently which were right oh eggs are terrible but it's like you know. 13 percent eight percent i mean rarely in nutritional epidemi epidemiology do you see any effects uh, even over 50%, much less 100%. And usually it's more in like the 10 to 15% range, which is, which is meaningless. It's crazy. And you can also see on both sides of the aisle, you see studies that are epidemiology that show that meat's completely safe Yeah. in the same way. And they're yeah. both kind of meaningless. Yeah. I mean, you know? the, so, you know, to be fair, it's really hard to do large randomized controlled trials in nutrition because you gotta, like you said, Impossible. you have to lock people in a in a metabolic ward and keep them there for twenty years yeah. because of the effects. If, especially if we're looking at real outcomes, which rather than just endpoints like cholesterol, yeah. uh, there is something there is something called the Bradford Hill criteria, which are criteria that. Uh, actually, I think were created around the time that these smoking studies were done because they're like, look, we can't just do a randomized control trial with smoking. We, we can't wait around for, yeah. Okay, that's, you guys that's, smoke for 20 unethical. years. You guys don't smoke, yeah, we'll see exactly. what happens. <laughs> so we need to figure out ways to, to better determine whether these correlations are actually meaningful and that there might be a causal relationship. Yeah. And one of those ways is what is the effect size? You know, how much of an increase do you see? Uh, another is, do you see, is it monotonic? Like, does it 
continually grow go up with an increased dose is of it a that linear thing. Relationship? Yeah, is yeah. there a dose effect response? And there are many other criteria that you can use to kind of get closer to the idea that yeah. there's a causal relationship, yeah. but those are rarely applied in these kinds of studies. We are bombarded with confusing information that can make deciding what to eat totally overwhelming. But with the right knowledge and resources, we can learn to decipher dietary studies to get to the real truth. Thanks for tuning in to this mini episode of The Doctor's Pharmacy. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider sharing it with a friend. Until next time.